welcome everybody to our uh, webinar uh, this evening, uh, which is an online photo critique with the great Mark Howardine, um, who I will introduce properly in a moment. Um, uh, as we have quite a few people on board, um, at this point, I will just um, promote the next two talks that we've got in our series, because obviously what tends to happen is towards the end, when we get to the Q&A section, um, we sometimes uh, lose a few people, which is perfectly understandable. Um, but 27th of April, which I think is Tuesday, um, we've got um, an Ethiopia presentation. And on the 29th of April, we've got Nagaholi. Um, and next week, we'll be publishing our series of talks that we're going to be doing in May. Um, but uh, I've been very much looking forward to uh, this evening's event, I have to say. Um, and uh, I know that Mark has too. He's been looking forward to it all year. Um, you know, I, one of the things I really love is looking at other people's photographs and great. analyzing them. It's one of one of life's great pleasures. I'm, I'm my own worst critic or best critic, whichever way you look at it. You know, my photographs. Yeah. I don't think I've taken a single photograph that I would say is 100% perfect. There is always something that you can improve. Have you ever um, taken a photograph that you really like? Really, really like. Yeah, well, at the time, yes, I'll often look in the back of the camera and think, oh yeah, that's fantastic. And maybe look on the laptop if I'm away. And But when I get back home and I start to look at it on the big screen and analyze it, there is always something that I would have changed, could have done sometimes little things, sometimes big things. Um, but I think that's how you keep improving. And yeah, of course. I noticed that when I used to, um, we used to judge the uh, wildlife photographer of the year competition, the BBC one, we used to chair the judging panel for years. And during a typical year, you'd look at, you know, 45,000 entries oh, and you whittle it down through different stages um, to the point where you get the last 1500 or so. And they're all fantastic images and you, you have to find fault to get rid of 1400 yeah. of them. Yeah. You know, so I, my whole, brain when I'm looking at photos is, is analyzing and looking at what's wrong I mean and that's part of the fun I mean looking at what could yeah, be improved and so on so you know tonight is, is one of my um, pleasures is looking at other people's photos learning from them marveling at them yeah. and criticizing them all at the same yeah, time yeah yeah all at once and yeah. uh, and, um, and, I, and, I, and I should um, I should give you the uh, uh, I should give you the introduction, really, because um, there may be someone out there, Mark, who doesn't know who you are. They might just think it's a bloke sat there with a whole pile of books on his right shoulder. Well, I have to say, I had a quick look at some of the photos we're going to be showing tonight just now, and I, I do recognise some of the... <laughs> yeah. And the animal, the individual animal. <laughs> I know a few people out there, at least. I know it's rather nice, isn't it? Um, but for those, you, for those of you that don't know Mark... Um, uh, Mark, Mark is a, a widely published photographer uh, and an award-winning writer. I think he's written more books than I've had hot dinners, um, though every time he writes a book he assures me that he's never going to write another one, but you've been doing that probably for all the years we've known each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and of course Mark has done some uh, wonderful TV and radio programmes, not least of which with, with Stephen Fry. Um, but perhaps more particularly in relation to this evening, um, and, uh, and, and to the skills, the many, many skills that Mark has, um, uh, is that, uh, of course, as Mark mentioned, he was the chair of the judging panel of the very prestigious Wildlife Photographer of the Year, um, which is obviously the, the world's finest wildlife photography competition. So I imagine that was an enormous honor. Um, but in addition to that, um, Mark was selected as being one of the top 40 most influential wildlife photographers by um, by Outdoor Photography Magazine. Or actually, was it Outdoor Magazine or Outdoor Photography Magazine? Outdoor Photographer in the States, the American oh, magazine. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, I, I, I've been very, very excited um, to get to this evening. I don't like to wish my life away, but it's always nice, as you say, looking at wonderful images and... Um, and having a chat about some of the places we've been to and so on. Um, but I really need to hand over to you, actually, Mark. And, and, okay, and I was going to say, Chris, would you would you fancy hanging on? Because there are a few places we've been to together. 
And yes. That'd be quite nice to reminisce while we're going through them. Absolutely. As long as I'm allowed to drink my um my my, yes, my, my so hang on in there instead of just disappearing. <laughs> yeah. No. No. Happily. Oh, happily. Okay. Yes. Well, first, I would like to thank everybody who's um, sent photos in. Very kind of you all. We really appreciate. It. We had a huge number of photographs sent in for for critique. Um, you must all be mad. But um, thank you very much. We we we, I, we won't get through all of them, but we're going to try and get through as many as we can. You know, while spending time talking about them all. And it's a it's a great variety of photographs. We've got everything from pied wagtails to polar bears and you know, not just far flung places, but in the UK as well, which is wonderful. Lots of us have been doing lockdown photography. I've done a lot of photography in the garden and actually learned some new techniques photographing garden birds over the last year, which has been fantastic. I'm going to apply when we do get traveling again to more exotic species. Um, so we'll just run through these photos one by one. Um, it's, a, it's no particular order. Um, I will say who took them, I hope that's okay. Um, I wasn't sure whether to um, name and shame or um, keep it quiet, but I'll say who took the photographs. I've got a little list here and we'll just chat about each one. And um, it'd be interesting to see what everyone else thinks as well. If you've got time at the end, anyone. I would, should, yes, I should mention the, the Q&A, like shouldn't I? I should. Yeah, should. We, have you got time to do that at the yeah. end? Yeah, we'll have time to, for, for questions and answers. And so so please do, apologies, I should have mentioned it, please do um, put questions to us on, on chat uh, and also on, on the Q&A, which should appear yeah, at the bottom yeah. of your screen. Yeah, it'd be great, be great to see what everyone else thinks. So it is very subjective. You know, that's the other thing. There's no correct mm -hmm. answer to any of this. It's the, These are my personal views, looking at it particularly from um, judging competition point of view. Um, what photos stand out. When you're judging a competition, you're looking for originality. So it's pictures that jump out that you haven't seen before, something a bit different. It doesn't have to be rare or exotic, any subject. You know, if you had a stunning photograph of a house sparrow, to me, that is as exciting in a photo competition as a mediocre picture of a polar bear, if you see what I mean. So, um, and apologies if I uh, do criticize. <laughs> I think that's the whole point. I'm not just gonna say, that's wonderful, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. They are in all their different ways, but the whole point is to talk about what I might change. And um, so I hope it'll be it'll be useful and interesting. So let's start with the first one. This is a red kite. It was taken in Oxfordshire by Stephen Moon. And I'd like to give Stephen 10 points straight away for one thing, which is not over-processing. And you know, the, the one thing that ruins a lot of photos is pumping up the saturation. Mm. It's really interesting when, you, when you're looking at, you know, thousands of images and people ha have amazing situations and experiences and encounters and, you know, maybe a wonderful sunset or, you know, in this case, I don't know, it's a bit of a rainbow, a bit of um, after a storm or something. Um, and Stephen has handled it just right. He's kept the colors neutral by pumping up, just because you've got a slider that goes all the way to the right and pumps up the colors doesn't make them better. And to me, what you're trying to achieve is a, an image that looks as natural as possible. You've already got that amazing color in the sky and the red kite is already beautifully colored. Um, and I think he's done a really nice job. It's a very nicely composed image. There's nothing really I would change. I love the way the kite looking into the bigger part of the frame and all the branch and the twigs and everything are there. There's nothing chopped off. Um, the one thing that minor, minor thing, and it's not Stephen's fault, is down, can you see my mouse if I use my mouse? Down yeah. in the bottom right hand corner, yeah. this bit here, it's, it's minor, 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 but if I had to find something I would change, it would be that, just because my eye went to that quite early on in looking around the frame, but it, it's minor. And I think the picture works really, really well. In Oxfordshire, of course, a lot of people have red kites in their garden. I know somebody who's, having um, breakfast outside on the patio and the red kite came down and nicked her Weetabix from the, <laughs> um, from the bowl. Um, and if you want to photograph red kites, the, the place that, that I know that is fantastic for them is Gigrin Farm in Wales. Yeah. So uh, have a look at that. So a yeah, really, really lovely picture to start off with. Aha, so Japanese macaques. This is in Koga National Park in Japan. It was taken by Sally White. And um, of course you probably know the, the the Japanese macaques or snow monkeys live further north than any other monkey in the world. And um, so they, it's cold. And so they like 
um, sitting in these hot bars and it's a great place to get, they're not bothered by people, great place to get really close to them. I have to say with Japanese macaques, it's, it's extraordinary, but in Wildlife Photographer of the Year, we get thousands and thousands of entries of Japanese macaque photos. There's certain subjects that get entered in wildlife photography competitions all the time. Polar bear is one, tiger is another one, and Japanese macaque is another one. So by the end of a week of looking at pictures of them, as a judge, you're generally quite sick of Japanese macaques and they have to be outstanding to stand out, to even get a chance of being looked at properly and passed through to the next round. Um, I like this one uh, for several reasons. I like the facial expression of the main macaque, just there enjoying the bath, eyes closed. Um, the other one behind works really well. Um, the one on the right, it'd be nice if the head was slightly higher. Um, it's sort of slightly covered up by the arm. Well, the one thing I would change in this would be that background. And um, it's one of those wonderful situations, if you're not careful, and I'm sure Sally found this, that it's so exciting to be there with these macaques all so close and all the steam off the water in this wonderful setting. You sort of panic. I mean, I, I know I do in these sort of situations and you have to stop and think, okay, I'm gonna take a few shots. I've got a record shot. I've got, I'm not, not that I'm saying this is a record shot, but I've got the shot, so I've recorded I'm here. And then stop and think and look. And one of the key things in photos like this is the background. And if you're lucky and it's a very cold day and there's more steam, of course, all you get is the steam as the background. What I would do would be to move around a bit and look for somewhere without that very artificial um, piping going across the back. I don't know, maybe, I'm not sure what else is there on the left, but maybe rocks or something, or, or go further back and zoom in with a longer lens and then you get a smaller background. You've got a smaller part of the frame. There are different ways of doing it, but you know that aside, I think it's a lovely shot and that expression um, of that macaque on the left just says it all. It's very relaxed, isn't it? Yeah, there's a bit of research being done on them because they obviously do it to um, keep warm. Yeah. But th there's a new theory that they also do it to relax. And the females spend longer in the baths than the, than the males because they are more dominant. Um, so they get to spend longer having their baths. And they, they reckon their blood pressure and heart rate reduces the longer they're inside the bath. So there's as with all of these behaviours, you know, there's probably more to it. We see it from a human perspective, just they keeping warm or yeah. they like having a bath, but there's probably more to it than that. Um, but anyway, lovely shot. So this is a this is another fantastic shot. Um, Bald Eagle, of course, this is in Alaska and it was taken by um, Jenny Varley. Hi, Jenny. Um, and there's not much I could fault with this, much as I'd love to, Jenny, as you know, um, I'd love to find fault if I could. But it's beautiful. It's a really lovely image, beautiful lighting. And, you know, I think there are three, three key elements to any photograph, any wildlife photograph. One is the subject. And I think that's possibly the least important, funnily enough. One is the background and the other one is the light. And you can take an amazing animal in terrible light and it's not going to be a great photo. You've got an amazing animal, you know, really impressive animal like a bald eagle in such spectacular light, then you're on to a winner. And Jenny has really captured it. If I, if I had to make one criticism and it's not Jenny's fault, it would be the perch, which is quite chunky. Um, and obviously that's where it was. So that's how it's going to be. Um, and again, it's, it's very minor. So a slightly more delicate perch would perhaps make the eagle look slightly more imposing and bold, bold, bald eagle. But minor, minor thing. It's a really, really lovely photograph. And even with that rim lighting and back lighting, you've got all the detail in the face. Look at that eye and the light coming through the beak. Um, it, you've really captured something really special there, Jenny. Uh, a lot of nice varied subjects, eh? Um, this is a coyote, of course, in Yellowstone National Park and taken by Anne-Marie Smith. Hello, Anne. I would say hello to everybody. I know you. Hello. Um, this is nice. This works really well. It's a, it's a difficult subject in terms of exposure. Um, have you been to Yellowstone, Chris? I haven't yet. Uh, 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 Nick is... Um... Nick Garbutt is uh, continually uh, encouraging me to go to Yellowstone. Um, and it's not for the want of trying, it's just it's always at our busiest time of year, because of course the best time is January, February, isn't it? 
well i've only been in the summer and in my dream is to go in the winter and you yeah know, this is what you get that all, all these different fantastic predators um and has got a she's exposed it perfectly quite tricky because um of the snow but you've got his perfect exposure on the coyote and uh he's still got detail in the snow nice simple shot you can i love the sort of diagonal line of the snowdrift there and it's interesting how in photography diagonals actually look better from a creative point of view um, than horizontals or verticals so if you're setting something up artificially like a, a perch in the garden for a bird for example put it at an angle instead of just horizontal and it will it will look it will add more impact to the image it looks much better so i love that diagonal line and, and I think what makes the shot is the face. You know, that, that expression on the coyote's face is brilliant. It's nice that it's not looking at Anne-Marie as well, but it can work really well when an animal, as we'll see later on, when an animal's looking straight into the lens, that can have high impact. But it's also nice to have them looking away, so it feels it's a more natural moment, almost like the coyote's, well, I'm sure it was, isn't aware of the photographer there, just carrying on its normal life. Of course, the key thing here is that eyes are sharp. Um, the body, there's a very shallow depth of field, which is fine. The body is slightly out of focus, and that's no problem at all. Um, if the eyes weren't sharp and the focus point had hit the body, that wouldn't have worked. I love the bits of snow on the fur. I, it, it works really, really well. I suppose if you want to make it to the next level, a competition winning photo, you'd have that nice bushy tail out behind it. But, you know, that's not the way life works, is it? That's very unusual. So I love it. Nice shot. Amazing colours as well. Actually, yeah, just... really lovely colours. Hey, look at this. This is, um, I'm not sure if it was in a local park. This, well, this is RSPB's Titchwell Marsh Reserve in uh, Norfolk. It's a, it's a really lovely reserve. Um, and a lot of people go there for more rarities, marsh areas and stuff like that. I get... I bet a lot of people actually walk past coots and don't give them a second glance. But um, this was taken by Matt Taylor. And um, he it's one of those pictures that, you know, you could be with a group of photographers and you could all have a look at your pictures in the evening. And somebody would show that and think, I didn't even see that photograph. You know, it's so easy to walk past something like that. It's a very well observed shot and it's beautiful light. It just works. It's a, it's a very dramatic shot. And it's a good example of how you don't need the animal to be big in the frame. You know, some of the some of my favourite wildlife photographers, professional wildlife photographers, are um, Scandinavians. And they have a real skill at showing animals in their environment. So they don't always... It's very interesting when, you, when you're looking at pictures, you can often tell what nationality people are, because... Um, a lot of American photography is much closer, I'm generalising, of course, but tighter portrait type photography. And the Scandinavians are brilliant at making the animals small in the frame and making the environment a big part of it. So I love this shot. It's, it's a very well observed shot, Matt. Um, if I were going to change it, what I would possibly do would be experiment with, um, and if I saw this and the coot stayed in position, I would stay there and take a lot of shots. And, you know, the great thing about digital is you can just fire away and it, it, it doesn't matter. You're not wasting anything. You can experiment with different compositions and um, just pick the best at the end. What I'd probably do would be to try, instead of making the where the reeds touch the water in the middle of the frame, I would probably go down so that the line where the reeds touch the water is a third of the way down from the top. And then assuming that there's still those reflections in the water, that would be the greater part of the image. And it would push the coot up to one of the points of power, as you call it. If you divide the image into thirds, where the lines cross in the top right, left, and bottom right and left corners, what's called a point of power. And if you try putting the coot on there,
and just see if um, if uh, that would improve and add a bit of impact to the image. Often by moving things to those third lines, you can change it quite dramatically. But it's gorgeous, gorgeous light and everything. And it just, just goes to show, you know, it doesn't have to be a fancy, exotic, rare subject, a coot, and you've got a picture that's as good as any. So lovely, great shot. Aha, back to um, Yellowstone. This is Peter Whitehead took this one, and it's a bison, obviously. It's another great example of pulling back. You know, it's a, it's funny, really, because if, if you, like me, you sort of remortgage the house to buy a great long lens, you know, my sort of go-to lens is a 600 mil lens, um, then you feel you've got to get your money's worth and you want to use it all the time. Um, but that's not the best way to go about photography. It's great to pull back. And this... You don't need to know anything about anything. You just got to look at that shot and you know that's Yellowstone. Um, and it is captured it be beautifully. Classic species found in Yellowstone, classic background and, and um, environment. And I think it works really, really well. Um, not much I'd change about it, actually. I mean, in an ideal world, if that was all snow, then it would add, it would make it even more wintry. But, you know, this is just me in my little dream world where I imagine what things might be in you know, La La Land, whatever it's called. But that's a, that's a lovely shot, a very good shot, Peter. Okay. Mm. Rwanda, you've been to Rwanda, haven't you, Chris? Uh, I've actually been to you to see the gorillas in Uganda, as it oh, happened, right. yeah. the gorillas in Rwanda, yeah. but I mean, equally wonderful, of course. One, one, of the, one of the most fabulous wildlife experiences anybody can have on earth, isn't it? It, it is, it's one, well, I've actually been to all three, Rwanda, Uganda, mm. and DCR, DRC and um, all very different experiences, but all the mountain gorillas in the Virunga volcanoes. And this was actually taken in Virunga and Rwanda by Robert Ackister, if I pronounce that right. Um, and it's brilliant. I, I love it. The, the colours, uh, obviously in the forest, you're looking through the leaves, you immediately go to the gorilla's eyes and you wonder what it might be looking at. Um, it's one of those shots, it's interesting, a good measure of photograph is if you can keep looking at it, you know, like if, you, if you're going to put it on the wall, for example, mm. how quickly you get bored with it. And I think this is one of those photographs where you would be able to see that, you know, you get up in the morning, walk past the picture and you would enjoy it every day. You wouldn't get bored with it. There's something about it that makes you wonder, gives a sense of wonder. If I was going to change anything, um, what do you think it would be, Chris, out of interest? Um, what, well, I'm not sure. I, I would, you know, I, I, I was wondering that myself because I was the, the one of the things that I love about this particularly is the reflections in the eyes. Yeah, they're absolutely Lovely. amazing. Um, I think I'm. I think I'm. You might say that uh, the perspective could be marginally lower, so you would lose the uh, that angle of green that goes across the. The, as we're looking at the image, the, the, the left-hand eye, which of course is the, the right eye of the gorilla, but I might be completely yeah. wrong. Yeah, actually that doesn't bother me at all. This doesn't bother me either, because it, it sort of makes you oh, feel like that. Uh, that you're looking through the foliage and it does, if it cut over the eye here, can you see my mouse okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, that. yeah. that would spoil the picture. The one thing I'm not so keen on is this. Uh, yeah, well, that was the other thing I was going to mention. Which again, you know, all these things I'm pointing out, none of the photographers can help that's how it was. But what I would do in a situation like this, and maybe Robert did, is to take loads of pictures. And if there's slight movement, if you get a chance, move slightly one side to the other. And I would, I would notice that and try to um, get it further out of the frame, even if it's just a little bit further down here, so it's not crossing over the mouth. But, you know, the, the mere fact that you hadn't spotted it, Chris, or thought it was a problem shows it's not spoiling the photo. It's just a minor little detail, but I think the photo is wonderful. One of the things really, that you really talk well. about, Mark, when we when we um, when we do these things together, um, when we're in situ, is you talk about um, the patrol that you do, the border patrol. It might be worth yeah. mention, mentioning that. Is this a good moment to mention that? Yeah, it's um, it's as it sounds. I mean, um, and it, it takes practice. So you got to do it really quickly. But when I'm looking through the viewfinder, I'm literally looking around the edges for anything sticking in or cutting across yeah. uh, that might spoil the picture. And then it's all in a split second, obviously, because the thing about wildlife photography is you don't have the time, of course, mm -hmm. to, you know, it's not like a landscape where it's going to stay there. 
people who move around. Um, so I'm looking and I would spot that. I mean, hopefully I would um, and try and move to a different angle or shoot slightly differently or do something to get rid of it. I would, I would take that shot first to make sure I've got it because I could, you know, it's an amazing photo. Once I'd nailed that, then I'd start looking for something else. And quite probably that was a split second mo you know, moment in time where it looked up and it was all over. So um, it's definitely not a criticism. It, it's just a comment that that's the kind of thing to look for. And if you can get around it, then all the better. So another, another lovely shot. One of the things that draws me to that shot, sorry, I know you've just jumped onto the next one, but is, is, the, um, is, is the fact that there's actually as much greenery in the shot in some respects as there yeah. is gorilla and, uh, and it's just wonderful it takes you there and it works and it's it you, you know it's part is a key part of the image yeah. one thing i would say is um i hope all of you out there have got uh, calibrated monitors if you haven't you're going to lose three points straight away because if you don't it's very simple um if you don't calibrate the monitor there's a sort of industry standard then all the colors are gonna look different on your monitor to how they do on mine and Chris's and so on. So if you have a calibrated monitor, then they will look as the photographer intended them to look. You might be looking at that with an uncalibrated monitor and think, oh, the green's too saturated or it's not green enough or whatever. But if it's calibrated, it will look exactly as the photographer intended. Okay, rain. Yeah, back home. This is in Kent and this is Mike Gaunt took this photo and it's a it's a lovely photo like I say background is key light is key and shooting into the light and making that silhouette is is really wonderful um, and getting it singing and you don't need to be that close you need the space you want to give a sense of place and make the most of all those wonderful colors um, as with the bald eagle and particularly with um, the, the wren I would say ideally a smaller bird like that looks better on a smaller perch um, but it's a detail again and it, you know it's just different just looks different I did um, I hope you don't mind Mike I did have a little just while we were setting up look at it in Photoshop I don't know if you can actually see the difference here so this is got quite a lot of noise I mean obviously it's quite dark conditions so I guess you might have been using quite a high ISO mic and um, what I've done is remove the noise and sharpened it slightly. So I'm gonna to change to my version of it. I don't know if you can actually see that. That is quite interesting, Mark. When Can when, you see that? Well, when you and I were looking before, I couldn't see it, but but actually now- Let me um, go back, I that's, that's go Mark's back. version. And it's just a little bit, I'm a great believer in not taking things out or adding things in Photoshop. Um, in other words, not cheating, not doing anything that wasn't there. But I think it's fine to just do something like this, which just improves what is there and what you see. So, so just do that again. So they're getting rid of the noise and the sharpening it up slightly. You can, it's, it's, you can, you can see the sharpening in the, um, well, I suppose it probably depends on how good the resolution is on your screen, of course. Yes, of course, it looked different on different computers. You might not see the difference. But, but, but yeah, you, 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 can, you can see it. You can see it around the wren and around the log or stump or whatever it is that, that, that Mick has taken it on. One thing I would say is there's um, some fantastic software called Topaz, T-O-P-A-Z, and um, it's not very expensive. Uh, it, it works independently of Photoshop and everything. And they have um, different software for different things. So they have Topaz Denoise, which gets rid of the noise, and Topaz Sharpener. And they are my go-to softwares, and they are amazing. And I'm not on commission or anything, I promise. They are just fantastic. They, they, if you've got a picture that's noisy, you took in dark conditions like this, quite a lot of noise there, um, or even if it's slightly soft, Topaz Denoise and Sharpener, Will actually make a massive difference and they're very very easy to use so have a look at those okay here's a lovely aren't there a lot of great shots it's really lovely to see all this so i think i think these are thompson's gazelles actually um they've got they can just about see their black band along the side of the body but it's also um, the shape of the horn i think yeah it looks right it? anyway this is in um they're gazelles in in um, masai mara in kenya 
used to be one of my haunts. I used to live in Kenya and spent a lot of time in the Mara. And this was taken by Andrew Wayne. And he has caught the perfect moment. Mm. I don't know whether that was, whether that was, I would say luck. That's not fair. But if you took one shot, um, Andrew, if you took a sequence, I, I will always be shooting fastest my motor drive will go. Um, and that's the way you get the perfect shot. And it's perfect because fantastic position and there's no other animal behind it. So it's all clean. There's no overlap. Um, it works. Re if that was sort of leaping a bit further, to get my mouse from, if it was over here with a hoof over here, it wouldn't work. We just feel uncomfortable. So it's perfect in that position there. Um, I think it actually works having the, the horizon bang in the middle, but again, um, depends on how big your sensor is. I'd, I'd try cropping in different ways, possibly try cropping out a little bit of the grass and make it a third of the way up from the bottom of the frame. Um, maybe get, and by doing that crop, um, just crop in a little bit, maybe over here or something. Um, I'd just experiment a bit, but I mean, that's being picky. It is a lovely shot, perfect moment, really nice. And a great part of the world. Any idea where this is? You get three points if you guess where. It's very mean of me to put you on the spot. Are you, um, but I've got it on the list. It says Kingfisher Pantanal. Well, I, it, <laughs> you didn't give me a chance to answer. Oh, don't tell me. Okay, what species of Kingfisher? Uh, it's a Eight belted. Point. Pardon? It's a ringed, I think. Oh, wow. Well, ringed Kingfisher. Ringed, it's by, rings, belts, the photographer know. is um, Andrew um, Anthony Bird, which is great. Like, I should be called Mark Whale. So this is a nice shot, Anthony. It's um, it's what it's typically where you see these kingfishers in the Pantanal. Um, a lot of foliage behind, very close behind. So it's very hard to blur it out of existence. Um, what I would have done in this shot would be, what I noticed is that that very bright branch up at the top there, the curvy branch at the top, and you could you could dull that down a bit in um, processing. Um, which I think would be okay because you, you're not going to take it out, you'll just dull it. Or at the time, I would have tried, I would have probably looked around and, and spotted that and brought the camera down a bit. I don't know what's below there, but if it was similar foliage and then push the kingfisher a bit higher up the frame, maybe up on that PowerPoint top left in that corner and have the foliage in front of it. Um, just, to, just to do a slightly different composition and get rid of that brighter branch with anything bright in an image like that, your eye tends to go to it. So you want you want to make sure that your eye goes to the bird. I think this is a female. It's got a, um, females have slightly different um, plumage um, on the chest. But anyway, it's a, it's a lovely shot, tack sharp, great moment, lovely catch light in the eye, beautiful bird, it's nice. That's what I just do. And again, if it stayed there, I would experiment different compositions. But um, great, thanks for that, Anthony. What do you think it was, male or female? I think it was a, well, I'm, I don't know. I think it was a female. You're going to check now, aren't you? Look it up. <laughs> yeah, I think the right. females have that chest and the males don't, but anyway. You're right, I'll let um, you on. So this uh, is a Western hopper, and I wouldn't have known that, in the Hearts Mountain in Tasmania by Ralph Ellis. And um, nice to have a macro shot and lovely background. You notice how by blurring the background, it makes the subject pop. Um, the background is critical with a shot like this. If, you, if it's all mucky background, you can't really see the subject, can't really see the hopper. It's nice and sharp. I love the fact there's little water droplets on the antennae there. Um, the only thing I don't like about the picture is it's a big perch again. Um, and it, it may well have been on that naturally, but often if you, if you try and make the perch uh, proportional in terms of size to the subject um, and often that's you can't move it but that's not possible but it often looks a little bit um, better but that that aside it's a lovely shot lovely light works really well nice to have a, a little critter in there as well great thanks for that um, okay something completely different this is in the uh, big cat sanctuary in Kent by Annette Rose Parton. And this is actually a Siberian tiger, um, which of course they're very, well actually there is one amazing photo. You probably saw the winner of the most recent wildlife photographer of the year competition, but it was a, a Russian, he's a mate of mine called Sergei Gorshkov. And he took that extraordinary picture of a wild 
Siberian tiger. Um, after two years of setting up camera traps in the tiger, T-A-I-G-A forest in the Russian Far East, I'd been there um, quite a few times looking for Siberian tigers and on anti-poaching patrols, never seen one in the wild. They're gorgeous animals, as you can see. So even though this was in captivity, you, you can't tell. You know, Net's done a really nice job of, of just capturing the, 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 the character of the tiger. Um, it's a really lovely picture. Um, I don't know what the, what the cage was like, the bars were like. One thing about blurring out the background is the lower down you get, the further the background is away. So if you're standing or kneeling even and photographing, you're shooting down slightly. If you are lying down or even or as low as you can get and shooting through the bars or the glass or whatever it is, then the background is that much further away and you can blur it even more. Um, but you know, it's, it is pretty blurred as it is. The tiger's lovely and sharp, the eye's sharp. Um, might have just moved open, pulled back a little bit to get the, those, the ends of those whiskers. That's another reason for doing that border patrol is just to make sure you're not chopping anything off. A, heavy crops are good, you know, so if you, um, if it looks like an intentional crop, then it works, is a good measure. If it looks like you just cropped it by mistake, then generally it doesn't. So things like whiskers, I would try and make sure I got them all in, or I'd do a very tight shot of just the eye and the, the nose and the mouth maybe. Then it's a, it's a determined, absolutely intentional crop and it looks good, but it's lovely. And I love it the way it looking up at something, beautiful eye, captured the character of a Siberian tiger perfectly. So thanks for that, Annette. How are we doing for time? I'm gonna speed up, I think. Um, it's too much to talk about. You know what that is? <laughs> Do you know, I saw a shoe bill before I saw a coal tit. Can you believe that? You're joking. I'm not. Simon Barnes um, uh, uh, makes fun of me for uh, for such a thing. <laughs> um, but, uh, yes, absolutely. What, what's not to like about a shoe bill? Oh, they're amazing. I'm not sure where that one was taken. That wasn't. Well, I've got it here. It was in uh, Mbamba Swamp in Uganda by Steve Edwards. Yeah. Oh, they're, they're, I mean, they're amazing birds. It was actually, Probably. I've not seen that many good photos of, of um, shoebills, um, which is, you know, they stand still quite a lot, don't they? Yeah. And they, they yeah. are obviously fantastic, very photogenic subjects. Somebody once described that bill as like a Dutch clog. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. it up quite well. They're not yeah. doing very well. They're decreasing in number. I think there's just a, a few thousand left. So I'm surprised more people haven't made an effort. This is, I would say, one of the best pictures of Shoebill I've seen. I did fiddle. Um, I hope you don't mind me uh, doing this, Steve, but I've just very slightly blurred the foliage and brightened it um, just, to, just to look at different ways of using aperture. So that with, the, with a bird like this, the bird, you can get the whole bird sharp, even with something like f4, even f2.8, depending on your lens. And that would mean that the other stuff around it just blurs slightly, which makes the shoe bill pop even more. But it was just, just to show the difference it might make. And I think, I think it's a really lovely shot. I'd be very, very pleased if I'd taken that. So um, yeah, great stuff, Steve. Thank you for that. <laughs> I like this one. <laughs> that, that is a, I've never seen one of these. I've got to admit, this is a tomato frog um, in Tasmania. And you can see why it's called a tomato frog. Um, and this was taken by, uh, sorry, not Tasmania, but in Madagascar by Serena Luther or L-U-T-H-E, Luther. Um, so yeah, the, um, a marrow and cetera, which is, oh, actually marrow and cetera, I need, do not have been there. It's a uh, northeast Madagascar and it's the sort of kicking off point for Nosa Mangabe, mm -hmm. where the IIs are. Great part of Madagascar. But I've never seen a tomato frog and I really love that composition. This is a the sort of shot that um, a magazine would love because they put the, the center down the middle there, they'd have the tomato frog on the left and they'd have all their text and copy on the right. Um, it's, a, it's a really, it's slide agencies and publishers love this kind of photograph. I was but going to say, that's, really exactly nice. sort of, that's exactly the sort of uh, image we would use on the introductory double page, one of the introductory double exactly. page threads of the brochure. It's perfect. Absolutely. Well, perfect. you need to talk nicely to Serena. She might let you use it. <laughs> Free holiday to Madagascar for the photo. Well, uh, with, with, with her entire family, surely. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing my best, Serena. Um, 
I love the leaf. That's a nice little touch. You know, it's um, it's quite nice how the foot's just on that leaf, and the eye is tack sharp. Um, and you don't need to see the whole frog to see what it is. It's just an interesting image. I love I love more experimental photos like that. So I really like that one. I'm going to move on a bit faster if that's okay. So this is a, um, it says Pelican Greece. I presume it's a Dalmatian Pelican. Uh, Hilary Flaxman took this. And Hilary, again, I love what you're doing. It's um, really nice to try something different. A nice slow shutter speed. Um, I do know people and some of you will be laughing because you know who I'm talking about, who do this all the time. <laughs> and um, I think you have to pick your moment. I think you have to um, choose when to do it, when it's going to work most. And this is, a, this is one of those moments. You can see it's a pelican, even though it's a very slow shutter speed. You've got all that movement. You've got lovely light. The colours are very sort of pastel colours, subtle colours. Um, and Hilary, I'm sorry about this. I did fiddle with your picture. Um, what I wasn't so well, first of all, you lose three points for all those dust spots. Look at this. And I can't criticize because I was giving a talk the other night and I put a photo up and I saw that same number of dust spots and thought, oh, how embarrassing. I should have checked all that. You've got it's almost like you've been eating your tea over the <laughs> sensor. Um, it's one of the big challenges of digital photography. And the trick is when you change lens, you turn the camera off. Otherwise it sucks everything in onto the sensor and you do it as quickly as possible. I remember one of the recent trips, well, recent, recent, relatively speaking. A couple of years ago, you mean. But on a beach and somebody put his camera down on the beach with the lens off on the sand, rummaging around in his bag, looking for another lens. And I almost had a heart attack and that's the way to get spot that maybe that's what Hillary's done just to get those spots so Hillary I've done two things I've removed that background or well, three things I've brightened it and I've got rid of some of your dust spots and come up with that just to simplify and again it's subjective you know you might all be thinking oh he's ruined it but to me the, the image is not about that background um, it's about the pelican and it's a really clean simple image and you make it cleaner and simpler by doing that, it's just a simple crop, brightened it, got rid of the dust spots, and I think that's improved it a bit. That's another. And I really do like that image a lot. It's another lovely background to a to a double page spread, isn't it? In a yeah, in a, really, exactly. Oh, it's, again, it's a very publishable image, and all the all the water down here and oh. the colours here, fantastic. So it's a lovely shot, Hillary. Um, maybe clean your sensor. Look at that. You don't have to go far afield to get a shot like this. Um, Obviously, this is a pheasant. It's in uh, Hampshire by Thomas Gray. And what makes it is you're peeping through the vegetation mm -hmm. and you're below the height of the pheasant. So Thomas um, has got really low down to the ground and he's got the, the focus perfect right on the eyes of the pheasant, even though he's shooting through all that foliage. The light is on the pheasant. Um, it's a really nice shot. There are so many thousands of pictures of pheasants out there in a competition. If that came up, it would stop everybody. Like, oh, hang on, I haven't seen a pheasant quite like that before. So it's a nicely seen photograph and, and very well executed. Here's another one from Hampshire. Um, this is obviously a nuthatch by Tony Matthews. This is really different, isn't it? I mean, you know, it's, you can take pictures of nuthatches on the bird feeder, but to get something like that is a whole different ball game. I imagine, I don't know, probably the camera was remotely set up um, at the bottom of the tree and um, I would imagine Tony was was controlling it with a remote control or his phone or something um, but very clever shot and the background is messy but it's far enough away even though it's a quite wide angle lens still to blur so that it's not fighting with the nut hatch uh, you can see all the detail of it. you can even see its tongue there um, that's a really clever, different photograph. So I think I think it's great. It's the sort of thing you can do, you know, with garden bird photography. Um, it's not just photographing birds on nut baskets. If they're in the garden or nearby. Um, try and do interesting setups like this. So yeah, I love that one. Lions. Um, this is in the Maasai Mara in Kenya by Elaine Foster. Um, it sort of speaks for itself. This one. I think it's it's it's. It's one of those shots that you've got to take a lot 
and one will stand out from the crowd, go through them all, and there'll be one where everything's perfect. I love the, the faces of all the lions and the tongue at the top is what makes it. I probably have tried to use a, a, a smaller, um, narrower depth of field just to blur the background a little more. If that was, imagine if that was a sort of green color wash, that whole group of lions would pop, but it's lovely. And I really like this actually, it sort of adds something, it's not in the way, it sort of frames the picture this side. Um, it's a, it's a, a lovely. I mean, maybe that's slightly soft, but um, again, it's me being picky. It's the tongue that makes it. The tenderness, isn't it, in a photograph? Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So we've been there. Yeah. that is. In fact, I should have got back from um, Baja yesterday, having normally spent two months um, there whale watching. This is um, obviously San Ignacio Lagoon on the um, Pacific coast of Baja, and it's taken by Charles Kinsey. And um, this is one of the friendly grey whales. Um, taken, you can see how close it was. The, the, the wide angle lens, look at how the horizon has bent because Charles has used such a wide angle lens. I know there are people out there who think, oh, this is really bad. You shouldn't be touching um, anything. And I would normally agree you shouldn't touch wild animals, but I do believe this is an exception and it's been happening since the early 1970s in San Ignacio Lagoon and um, the whales will actually come to the boats. Many times I've done little tests where we'll have people in two boats, you have little small boats with little groups and one will just sit with their, you know, sit on their hands and not touch the whales and not splash and the other boatload will splash and play with the whales and the whales always go to the people who are active and splashing. They, they like to be scratched and tickled. There'd been a lot of work done, doesn't cause them any harm. There'd been no evidence of transfer of germs or anything. And without going into a great long story, if this wasn't happening in San Ignacio Lagoon, there would now be a big salt extraction plant there and there would be no whales. So this friendly behavior saved the whales. Um, and it's a lovely shot, Charles. I mean, um, I love the hand. You know, you can see inside the whale's mouth, there's all its baleen plates and the hand just tells you the whole story in one fell swoop. And there's another whale coming up behind. I think the only criticism would be here. This is the mothership. And um, I'm not sure you can straighten horizons in Lightroom, for example. It might be worth experimenting with that and see if you could then crop the boat out and still keep that second whale. Hey, that's interesting, Mark, because you. Yeah. Because I was just about to say, I mean, I know I'm not the one critiquing the photographs, but I was going to say that one of the things I love about this photograph is that you can see the mothership in the background. I love oh, it. Well, you know, touche. Like I say, so I'm drawn in. I'm drawn into well, the whale by the fact that there's the mothership in the background and I can I can I can see what's happening. Maybe that's because I've been there and I know it. Well, OK, suppose we keep it in just so Charles doesn't get too big headed because it's such a great shot. He should have got the top of the boat in. But, you know, joking aside, um, a lot of the photography here is so fast and you're so low in the water. What I'm generally doing is I'm, I've got my camera and I'm just leaning out with a wide angle lens on and firing. I'm not even looking through the viewfinder. And when you do that kind of photography, it's a good idea if you've got a little zoom lens to zoom out as far as possible and pull back a bit, then you've got that room for manoeuvre. If you try and get it exactly right without looking through the viewfinder, you'd be very lucky. So I get with whether Charles was looking through the viewfinder or not, but generally that's what I'm doing. So it's very hit and miss. So you do crop things off like that a lot. Okay, let's move on. Another line, this is Botswana, and this was sent in by Jackie Edwards. Great, great shot. I love, I love it when you do something different, you know, again, like I said at the beginning, we, in the in the competitions, wildlife photography competitions, you get thousands of lion pictures. You know, seen every possible lion picture you think, but then you get something like that. And you think, yeah, there are other ways of doing it, and this is this is really original. I love the idea of focusing on the foreground, and it's it, you can, even though the lion's blurred, you can see it's a lion. Of course, it's gorgeous light. Um, it's it's a really lovely shot. I mean, again, I would I would experiment um, if it was standing there for a few moments. I would um, pull back. It's a good reason to have a, a zoom lens rather than just a fixed telephoto all the time. 
try and get the whole line, get a tighter shot, maybe an upright with the brought down to the feet and the head. Um, but, you know, they're just variations on a theme. And I, I really love that. I really love what Jackie's done. So fantastic shot. Really nice to see something different like that. Uh -huh. Brown bear and cubs. Now, these are actually in uh, Lake Kuril in um, southern Kamchatka in Russia. I haven't been to Lake Kuril, but I've been to Kamchatka many times, and it's one of my favourite parts of the world. You know, we go to Wrangell a lot, don't we? Um, you do, isn't that I, just I love Russian Far East for wildlife and wilderness. It's just spectacular. This is a really nice shot. Um, I've just, you might not see the difference, but I've used this... Um, Topaz sharpener software on it. Um, hope you don't mind. Um, this is Tina Bully who's taken this. There we are. Can you see the difference? So you can see the difference in the look, look at around the look look around here. Yeah. Around the eye. So I've just sharpened it there, and it gives it punch. So it suddenly leaps out of the frame. Um, it's nice because it's a nice low angle. You're almost just below the bear's eye level. Um, the cubs are great. The, the cub on the right hand side, ideally you'd see its head. That would be the one thing. And again, if they're playing, I'll just keep firing. And I generally go for long periods without taking any photographs. But when something fantastic happens like this, I'll take loads. And I think, um, that's the way you might get it's even a split second when the other cub lifts its head up and that would then lift it from a great shot to a really stunning shot. Um, but, you know, again, it's being picky. I, I love it. And I love the posture of the, the mum there. Lovely. So that was um, Tina Bully. These mm -hmm. are Austra Australasian gannets. This is a Murawai um, gannet colony in Auckland, which is... Um, I've been to it, it's, it's a wonderful spot, not very far outside Auckland in New Zealand. And I, I spent the whole time I was there actually, the sun was going down and they were these gannets were flying in front of a, a rock face that went into complete shadow. So all my pictures of these gannets were the gannets lit up by the sun with complete black behind, <laughs> which was really nice. A completely different shot to this, which, um, which I think is wonderful. This is Helen Hackney. Um, sent this one in and what makes it is the gannet just turning and looking at Helen. Um, she's, got, she's got everything in the picture, the lovely rough sea down below. Looks like you're there flying with the gannets, which I think is, is, is uh, makes the shot wonderful. Following the other one off there, it's all lovely composition. I wouldn't change anything. It's that turn of the head that lifts it to that other level. Ah, yes. Bluebells, bluebell wood. This is um, Ashridge, um, which I think I think is in the Chilterns. I'm not sure about that. Um, and I haven't got the photographer's name. You, you can look. At, have you got your notes there, Chris, to see who took this photo? Uh, I'm not. Oh, well, I took, OK, um, park that thought. I'll tell you in a second. OK, I'm really sorry. We'll find out who you are. Um, I've got a list here and there's one gap. Um, this is nice. I, I love the shot because of that arch at the end. You're looking through the avenue of trees and it's almost like a, uh, a church arch um, at the end with that one tree bang in the middle there um, and an amazing carpet of bluebells. Also, what makes it, you've got a little zigzaggy path here that leads your eye in. Um, this is the arch here with that single tree in the middle. I would experiment by trying getting lower. Um, what I would try to do would be to, to have a very similar picture, but to get down low and maybe make this line of bluebells here blurred. So you'd end up with a, a, a I'm terrible at purple mauve, whatever that is, um, a blur here of bluebells. And then that would be the foreground. And then your eye would be led through to the rest of the picture. So that's the only thing I would experiment, try and do something there, lie down in the bluebells if you could without, without um, flattening them all, and just do that with a few in the foreground and, and make them blurred, have them really close to the camera, and then get that wonderful avenue and arch. So I'm really sorry, I don't know who that is. No, I can, tell you, I can tell you, that was, that was taken by Bev Bishop. Okay, great, sorry about that, Bev. Okay. 
fantastic, <laughs> lovely. This is obviously a leopard. This is in South Luangwa, Zambia, which I know Chris is your favourite place. And taken I've never heard of it. Graham never. Tarrant. That's an amazing shot, isn't it? Good. Well, you spent a lot of time there. How many times have you seen something like that? It, it, very, very rarely. I mean, you see, uh, yeah, very rarely. I've seen lots of leopards. I've seen, I've had leopards coming out of my ears pretty much, uh, but you very rarely see something quite as chilled out and as relaxed as that. I mean, that's, you know, it's, uh, yeah. I mean, that's- yeah, it's, uh, it's great. It's cool, a, isn't it? I wouldn't fault the shot at all. The, the Everything about it, the pose is like my dog, the paws like this. Yes. It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And that that just look of happiness and, and um, safety and I don't know what the right words are it just looks calm and relaxed um the only thing that would improve it would be the the ground you know it's it's a it's a dry earth and if you had a bit of color or grass or something but again it's it's minor it doesn't it doesn't detract from the image the subject is superb would, would, would well you have got out and moved it Mark? Pardon? Well, yeah, it's, it's, they got out and moved. But like I say, I live in La La Land. It's my every time I look at my photos, I think, well, if only it was like this, or if only the light was like that. Or, but again, that's how you 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 think about. It. That's how you learn, and you you know, mm. you couldn't have done anything different at the time. But it's something to be aware of and to think about if you do have an option to, you know, move. Maybe there's another leopard doing something similar. I don't know. I mean, um, it's definitely not a criticism. It's just um, thinking what would lift that photo from a wonderful shot that I'm sure everybody when they saw it went oh and you know you then got a winning shot um and that would make it uh and a competition winner see what I mean so that's lovely so thanks Graham okay we'll do a few more and then I think we're gonna have to um we've already passed time pied wagtail and some sort of cow not so good on that um that's a pie that's in Scotland sent in by Caroline Stredder and um, what makes this work is that there's two things. One is the, the complete contrast in size of the animal. And the other is that pose of the pied wagtail. You know, if the pied wagtail was just walking, it wouldn't have the same impact. But it's, it's on the move, leg and foot up in the air. It, it's brilliant. I really like that shot a lot. And that next to the giant um, makes it very, very special. Sorry if I'm whizzing through these. Goldfinch, this is in Otterbourne in Hampshire, where we're actually going in a couple of weeks, aren't we, Chris? A couple me? of weeks' time. Well, we went there. Didn't we go there just before the last we did. one of the we many did. lockdowns? I mean, what a, that's a tremendous place to go to, isn't it? But uh, I know that yeah. Mick and have been there with us. Wonderful for bird photography, and we're just going yeah. for a couple of days. Well, I'm actually doing a book, but it's an excuse just to go out and take some photographs. <laughs> um, and this was sent in by Alison Gaunt. And Alison, I've just brightened it slightly there see the difference just slightly you may prefer your version but just to bring out a bit more of the color um of course goldfinch on thistle that's a classic but i really love that i mean you know it's all about the background again and it's the light you know you can get a goldfinch on a thistle in midday sunshine it would be horrible but everything about that is lovely the pose is tack sharp beautiful bird you can see all the detail on the thistle um, it, and the background is, is wonderful. So I, I think it's a great shot. We didn't get anything that good, did we, when we were there? Well, I probably did, didn't. Not, anyway. I don't suppose you did. <laughs> hey, another, another different lion shot. We had a few lions, um, or lioness. This is in Botswana, sent in by Alan Brackley. And what makes this is A, the eye contact, and B, being down low being down at the lion's height. If that was taken from, it's you know, you can you can make it look as if you were low by shooting with a long lens from further away because the angle is less, or you can, you know, be right there lying on the ground. Um, but either way, this is great. And I said it with the coyote in Yellowstone, I love the way it's looking away from the camera like it's not aware the photographer's there, but this is a complete opposite. And that eye contact is what makes this photo. Lovely light again. It's all about the lion, um, and I, I wouldn't change a thing. I think it's fantastic. I think that's one of the, the light in the eyes. The it's really, something. really good. So well done, Alan. Alan Brackley. This one is in Seven Oaks, Kent. A fallow deer by Janet White. Um, again, it just shows what you can do by shooting close to home. And um, 
The great thing about shooting in parks is that the animals are more used to people. So you can go out in the countryside. It's like, you know, if you go and try to photograph a fox in the countryside, um, it's going to be running away. It's going to be nervous. You need many, many more hours and more field skills and everything. You photograph a fox in the city, it'll just stand there while you, you know, check your exposure. Same with, with shooting deer in a park like this. It's a really great way to get fantastic shots and to experiment. Um, the only thing I'd change here, I love, I love the framing. This is really nice framing. You've got the slope up here and the tree makes a sort of frame here. Is that background. And again, if you spent time with the deer, just notice things like that. Try and move around, probably okay for you walking around and get a slightly different position, higher or, or preferably lower or to the right in this case and get rid of that background. But that would improve it. But it's, it, it just shows what's possible. That's lovely. So thanks, Janet, for that. Let's do, we're going to do uh, one, two, four more. Leopard cub. This is in Kenya by Jackie Downey. Um, it speaks for itself. I bet everybody went, oh. And it's the sort of thing you just dream of seeing when you're on safari somewhere like Kenya. Um, captured the moment perfectly. So it's a really nice shot. And it doesn't have to be tight in. It shows a sense of place. All that foliage really gives you an idea of where the, the cub is. Um, and actually, all this, this background here is quite colourful. If that was just a plain pale blue sky, it wouldn't have as much impact as having some of this colour in here as well. So, and it's tack sharp, you've got all the detail of the, the whiskers and so on. Very nice shot. Uh -huh. This is a, obviously a killer whale. This is in the Salish Sea off uh, Vancouver Island by Nick Woodman. And Nick, if I'm not um, incorrect, I think I was probably standing next to you when you took that. Um, and my shot wasn't as good. We had the most amazing evening. Absolutely gorgeous light, as you can see. It didn't last very long. Often these things are over before you've really sort of got the hang of what you're doing. Um, and Nick's caught a perfect moment. Don't know if you actually took it upright, Nick, which would be pretty impressive, or cropped it, doesn't matter. It works either way. Look at the, the light on the dorsal fin here. Um, that wonderful bow wave. Um, nothing else matters. You've got the beautiful blow that stands out because you're shooting against the light. It makes the blow really stand out and it makes the background go much darker. Um, now, I can't quite see because our pictures, Chris, were right at the top of my frame, but I think the blow's chopped off at the top slightly. So my uh, yeah. only criticism would be just up a little bit. 99% um, of people looking at that wouldn't even notice, but I'm afraid I do because I'm doing that border patrol. Um, but it's picky. It's a beautiful, beautiful shot. There are millions of pictures of killer whales out there. And that's one that will make people stop in their tracks. And it, and it was a, great to reminisce. It was a lovely evening, Nick. OK, two more. Oh, I've only black and white one. Um, these are lions, obviously, in the Serengeti in Tanzania. Susie Dillon um, sent this in. And that's a stunning shot. Black and white is actually quite difficult. You know, um, people tend not to shoot in black and white now. Nowadays, we shoot in colour and then change it to black and white. I always use a particular software called Silver Effects Pro, um, which is fantastic, a really good way of doing it. And it's very difficult to get it right, to get the, the strong, the powerful contrast, um, but also get that gradation across all the different greys and blacks. And, and um, Susie's done that brilliantly. It's a really powerful looking lion. Uh, that mane is brilliant. Only criticism, and I'm sure you spotted it, Chris, is that lioness's head is just slightly hidden. Yeah. Um, but you, the, the point is your eye goes straight to the lion and its mane and its eyes and wonder what it's looking at. Um, and so that's secondary. But that lioness's head just showing more to the right out would, would turn that into a competition winning shot. To that's me, so that's, that's, that's it. That the, the power of the lion oh, it's wonderful. is is but it, it's and and the position of the lioness the position of the lioness's head actually makes the the power of the lion more yeah you could argue that yeah. in in that 
you know, rightly or wrongly, but that's what it is. It, look, that's what it, how that's the impression I get from that image. It's an absolute. And you could argue it doesn't distract from the the lion's head, but um, again, it's subjective. But it would have been lovely to have seen two: one with the head up, one with it like this, and you know, to to see what we felt. But it's it's a stonking shot, brilliant shot. Thanks for that, Susie. And let's finish on this one. This is uh, photographers doing their thing with polar bears. This is in Svalbard and it was sent in by Francis McKim. And um, we've both been there. I think I recognise that ship, the Vavilov or the Eofi, um, many times. And um, you recognise the bears? Pardon? I don't recognise those particular bears, no. <laughs> um, but that experience, and it's, it's fantastic because everybody's there just shooting the bears, but it's so lovely to come back, get up onto a higher deck, and show the whole experience you know that that's what people will relate to because we've all seen lots of pictures of polar bears um lots of nice close-ups and so on it's quite tricky getting great shots of polar bears at that angle it's a fantastic experience when they come that close to the ship but you're shooting down at an angle and unless they sort of stand up on their hind legs and look up at you it's a it's a quite an awkward angle so it's a very clever idea to run up or by sheer chance. Like, do you remember when we were in Wrangell and we were on the top deck and the no, walruses? Yeah. I mean, it's just lucky. We had a herd of walruses come right underneath. Um, so I don't know if Francis was up there already or ran up, but it's a, it's a great angle and it's really nice to get something different. And that is the, the, the best sort of shot you can get when they're that close. It just captures the experience brilliantly. So. Photographers doing their thing is a lovely one to end on. Let's finish there. Sorry, well, that's, all, that, that's, that, that's also um, wildlife in its environment, isn't it? In that particular. Yeah, it's a lovely context. picture. Yeah. Well, I think I think the overall well, the standard is brilliant. You know, there's some there's some fantastic photographers out there and great photographs. And you know, I apologise for my my criticisms, but hopefully it at least gets you to think, even if you disagree. Um, you know, it's how you analyse the picture. And if you, you know, you analyze your own pictures in that way, I think it's a great way to, I mean, I love, it's a very good thing to sort of flick through a magazine like BBC Wildlife Magazine or flick through the Wildlife Photographer of the Year book and just see where you stop and the pictures that, that jumped out at you and, and think, what, what was it about that that made me actually stop and have a closer look? And, um, you know, analyze what it was, why it was a particularly good photograph. And I think that's a, that's a really great way to make your brain think in that that uh, on that wavelength, so that when you're out there taking pictures, you're thinking about it more constructively. I I think um, uh, well you to, together with Nick and 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 Alex and one or two other of our, and Joe of course and one or two other of our pals, it, you you have completely got me into photography as you know, um, and I find it fascinating now and I look at all sorts of things and, and, and love looking at them and, and having my own thoughts and ideas on, on how I might change things. Um, and, and, and you and I have spoken at length about the ethics of certain aspects of wildlife photography. And there were a couple of things that um, during the course of this evening uh, uh, made, made me think particularly about that. One was the nut hatch, which was a cracking shot of a nut hatch where you're sort of, where we were, we were looking up at the nut hatch, weren't we? Up, mm -hmm. up, up, up the bow of the tree. Um, and that would have been taken probably with some form of camera trap, I would, I would imagine, uh, as you suggested. Or well, a remote camera, probably, yeah. Well, yeah, which in a sense is a, is a camera trap. I mean, I, I mean, perhaps that's not quite the right description. But the other one, I was thinking about it when you were talking about the nut hatch, um, was um, the, the, the tiger that won wildlife photographer of the year which which was taken with with camera traps wasn't it um uh Ser sergey is that that's the yeah guy? sergey Gorshkov, yeah and um what 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 are, what are the ethics of that what do you think the ethics of that are because he wasn't behind the <laughs> camera when he took the photo well when i was chairing that competition i used to get hate mail from people who think that camera trapping is cheating and you know people would write me these very nasty letters and emails saying but you know, the photographer just put the camera trap out there and then it took the pictures while he was in a hotel having a beer. That's where I was and going well, with that. Actually, I, I think I'm a huge fan of camera trapping when it's done, you know, really professionally. And Sergey is, is the one of the masters. There are, there are several people who just do it fantastically. And 
you need a lot of different skills. You've got to have, you, you've got to know where to put the camera trap. Mm -hmm. I mean, you may remember probably 15 years ago now, one of the winners of that competition was a, a snow leopard in the Himalayas taken yeah. by a, a photographer called Steve Winter with a camera trap. Yeah. And um, that was in sort of early days when it was really becoming the thing to get shots that you, that you no way you could get in any other way. And it's still to this day, the best picture I've ever seen of a wild snow leopard with all the snow falling down and, yeah. you know, in the yeah. night, in a pass, in the middle of nowhere in the Himalayas. Um, and yeah, Sergei's picture of the Siberian tiger in the middle of nowhere. There's nobody for hundreds of miles. Um, so you need to know where to put the traps. And that's that's a major skill. You need to have the te technical knowledge. So you've got to have, you know, you, you're taking a picture when you're not there. So you've got to know, you've got to guess how to focus, where to focus, where the animal's going to be in the frame. You've got to compose it without the animal in the frame. You've got to get all the different flashes. And very often there's several flash guns, all different powers maybe one behind to give a bit of room light you've got to have all that set up you've got to know how to waterproof it all sergey had rigged up these very complicated setups with car batteries so they could leave the yeah. traps out in the field for months at a time you know my camera trap i use in the garden here you've got to keep changing the battery every morning <laughs> you know you can't do that if you're doing it in the middle of nowhere in russia um so all that technical knowledge and you have to be creative and compose the image. You know, Sergei's picture of the tiger with that gorgeous tree. He'd seen the rate that the scratch marks on the tree, guessed that there might be tigers there, but he composed the image without the tiger there. So to me, there are so many different skills involved in, in a really good camera trap photograph. Um, far from just plonking the camera out and having a beer, it's very involved and um, you know Sergey used many camera traps as well he didn't just use one obviously he had them all he'd used these trail cams for a long time working out where the animals were going and based on that information worked out where to put the main cameras and had to protect them from bears and tigers and it's a, it's a massive undertaking and he, he've got no guarantees he, he spent two years he might have got nothing the fact is he got an amazing picture um, so I'm a great admirer of it and I, you know, I don't really understand why people criticise it because we're getting pictures now of species that we've never seen before. You know, the chance of actually getting a picture of a wild Siberian tiger, anything remotely like that, by being there, is just about nil. So, so, so I, I think this is, um, I know you're too modest to mention it, but I think um, it's, this is a good moment to mention your... Um, uh, recently started YouTube channel, um, which for anybody that that, that 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 doesn't know, well, I mentioned it because we're talking about camera traps, right? And well, yeah, the, actually, yeah, that's and true. and it's and it very very pertinent because the first one in the series, which came out last Thursday, if I remember correctly, um, yes, you were actually interviewing a guy called Sam Hobson, um, who has taken one of the most cracking photos um, of an urban fox. Yeah, right in front of the Clifton Suspension Bridge in Bristol. I mean, that, that's absolutely fantastic. And, this, yeah. and the story behind that and the story how it's all taken is absolutely yeah. fantastic. So for anybody who, who is on board and who wants to see something really superb, either go to Mark's, Mark's website. I know where there's a link on Mark's website or go to the BBC Wildlife website and there's a link. And yeah. this is a series that, that, that Mark is... Uh, Mark is yeah, I was very lucky because Sam took this extraordinary photo of a fox beautifully lit against the suspension bridge in Bristol and he reveals exactly how he did it and how he went about it and um, very generous of him so yes it's a weekly program on called the BBC Wildlife Photography Masterclass so tonight's one is about photographing flocks of waders at um, Snettersham in North Norfolk yeah and then um, next week I've forgotten the order it all happens here oh Benson Mate um, yeah talking about Hyde, Hyde, Hyde Guru, who's yeah. won Wildlife Photographer of the Year and, and um, Junior Wildlife Photographer of the Year more times than you can possibly imagine. And then we've got Sergey, and then we're talking about um, garden bird photography and camera traps to photograph badgers and the whole me and it's for anyone who loves wildlife photography, basically. So, so we should probably answer one or two of the, one or two of the questions that have been posed. Um, okay. Uh, 
um, I, I, sh I shall, uh, oh, Jeanette, sorry, I'm just going to answer Jeanette's, um, Jeanette has just posed something on chat. So Jeanette, um, if, if you go to, if you Google um, BBC Wildlife magazine, um, you will see a, an image of the gentleman that is also on your screen at the moment, Mark Cowardine, and if you click on that, um, you will see Mark's YouTube channel, um, and it's specifically about wildlife photography. Um, so hopefully, hopefully you've got that. Um, We've had so many lovely uh, comments about uh, the critique that has happened and the um, uh, and the uh, and the excitement that people have had at looking at these amazing images. It's yeah, it's fantastic. really super evening. Um, uh, someone who has re remains anonymous said uh, since we again since we were talking about um, camera traps and so on, should photo competitions have them as separate categories? Effectively, have a camera trap category, maybe a drone photography category. Drone photography is another amazing area, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting thought. I mean, there's also debate about whether they should have a, another category for manipulated photos. Yeah. And um, I could I could talk straight rant about this for hours, but the short answer for me personally is, yes, I think it might be a good idea to have a separate category for um, camera traps and drones. Drones is a whole other issue because there's some very irresponsible drone flying. I mean, I remember probably a year ago now seeing a video on YouTube somebody had filmed of a giraffe with a drone and they were flying around the giraffe's head and it was running in a complete panic you know that's absolutely it goes without saying is appalling but within the rules of the the law and you know being sensible you can use drones I do it with whale photography but shooting very high so I think you know if it's done responsibly that would make a good category the manipulation, no, 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 no. I don't think if you have another category, it suggests that it's a good idea, right? I personally believe that you can change the exposure and do that kind of thing, uh, get rid of the dust spots, um, you know, crop, but not add anything like, for example, add a second panda cub or something, which people do, or remove anything. So if you took a prize winning shot, but there, you know, Chris, if you're standing right behind, then that's just tough. You could easily Photoshop you out, but I personally think that's wrong. So that's the one thing I wouldn't. Tommy never said that. Say. I thought you'd be a great advocate of Photoshopping me out of all. Well, maybe that would be the one exception. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that would be the short answer to that. Um, so Millie and Liam have, have asked a, a, a cool question, I think, because um, I think I kind of know the answer. Um, what's your favourite animal to photograph? That's the first question they've asked and the second question is what's the most difficult animal you have found to photograph so far well my favorite and this will sound very um very uh cliche but it is whatever i'm photographing yeah. and you know I, I i genuinely have had a lot of fun um you know weekends and so on photographing birds in the garden I'm very lucky to have badgers in the garden as well and I've been experimenting with camera trapping and remote cameras and different flash setups. And that's been brilliant fun. Um, and like, like our couple of days we had in the Hampshire Hides, you yeah, know. Yeah, we, which is great. You know, we both spend our lives traveling the world, but many times we've talked about that. So what a great couple of days, just photographing birds and reflecting pools and so on. Um, so whatever I'm looking through the lens at, but if I had to pick a subject, it would be whales. I mean, that's what I spent a lot of my life photographing it is incredibly um, challenging because they spend so little time at the surface and generally so so little of themselves at the surface um, but you know over 30 years I've built up a collection and, and learned little tricks and uh, so on that, that improve your chances so I think if I, if I had one more day of photography I would it would be a whale of some sort and as, as far as the most challenging um, that, that's really difficult I think it was, I did a shoot some years ago now in Australia of uh, dwarf minke whales. And um, I, there's a place where you can, you can basically, you're on a boat, a liverboard boat, and they, they let a rope out and you tie yourself to the end of the rope and it's quite a strong current. You're dragged along and the whales come up and look at you. If you, if you swim around freely, they don't like it and they swim away. Um, but we had 28 days of horrendous, horrendous weather and everybody being sick the whole time. 
no whales or anything, couldn't see anything. Then the very last day, the weather calmed down enough, got in the water. Um, this was in the days of film and um, I had a dry suit on and there was no way I was getting out. Um, so I was e eking this out and I was in, on the end of the rope for seven and a quarter hours <laughs> and um, got the, sorry, and it was just after the days of film. That was what I was going to say. So uh, with film, I'd have had to get out every 36 shots, but it was one of my first tastes of the wonders of digital. And I could stay in the water for seven and a quarter hours, bursting for a pee. But the principle was after 28 days of nothing, awfulness, that was the moment. And I, I did get the shots I wanted. Um, so so um, I remember you telling me a story uh, about a, 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 a whale image that you nearly got and didn't. And it's one of the images that you regret not having taken. Do you remember that? Do you remember any more than that? That's quite yeah, I do. I remember, I remember exactly what Go it was. On, tell me. Um, it was blue whales. I did, there's, there's a really cool story that goes with that. Um, and uh, I think you were in a, I think it must have been off the coast of Iceland. And it was a pair of blue whales that were on their side, just with the, with mouths open, just about oh, the speed yeah. of one reason or another, you couldn't get the shot. Well, you could write books and books of all the mist. In fact, I have been working on a book quietly in the background called You Should Have Been Here Last Week which any naturalist will, will relate to, which is that sort of thing, like the number of times you've arrived somewhere and they say, oh, they've been here all season, they've just left yesterday, yeah. um, or there were millions last week, they've all gone, or, you know, I was looking over here and somebody was looking over there and the whale breached there and I was looking at nothing. It happens all the time. So, yeah, I do remember that occasion, but sadly it's one of many. I, I, if I'd caught everything... I've seen on camera, I'd be laughing. Yeah, but you're one of these, you, you have an extraordinary ability to capture things, even when you've got to run inside and go and get your camera and come back, uh, the wheel's still in the air. Well, that's just ruined what I was going, I was going to say, that one of the tricks is always to be ready, and I never learned that trick. <laughs> but, you know, the people who catch the shots are the ones with the cameras around their neck, even though nothing's happened for several yeah. hours. Yeah, yeah. And um, the, the camera's switched on, and if the battery drains, they just put another battery in, but it's still going to be on and they catch the moment. But if you, if you do leave your camera inside, which I do, um, and you're out there with a coffee, then it all happens, it. you know, one day I'll learn that lesson. I think that happened to me when, um, when the, uh, when the whale went under, when the whale went underneath the bow of the ship uh, in Wrangell, and I, I, my, my battery had run out. Oh, the bowhead whale. That the bowhead was... whale, sorry, yes, I should have said, yeah, bowhead Oh, whale. you missed one of the best whale encounters in yeah. the history of the planet. Well, no, we saw it before it went under the bow of the ship, and I saw oh, it afterwards. I just I'd didn't... forgotten you'd missed that one. Yeah, well, you know, I think I was probably collecting, I think, well, I know I was collecting a battery. Um, the hey, other look... trick is never go in to have a pee, because that's when everything happens. Like, so <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have to rush in as a last resort. <laughs> There's a there's a lovely question here from Jane, which which might be a really super way to to end this evening. Um, and Jane says, um, "What are your top five locations for wildlife photography?" And I propose that we bat them between us. Oh my goodness! Anywhere in the world. Um, yeah. Come on, I know. I I mean, you know. Well, okay. I'm doing it by subject. Why don't we do it by subject? And this okay. not in any order. It's just the top okay. five. Okay. Polar bears would be Wrangell Island in Russia. Yep. Whales would be um, Baja California. Baja. Yeah, yep. San Ignacio Lagoon Baja yep. for the friendly grey whales. Yeah. Um, I'm with you for both of those. Then I'd probably, God, it's so that's really difficult. Um, so let me throw one into the mixture. Yeah, go on then. So I, I, I would say um, leopards in South Luangwa National Park. Yeah. There's you no know, way better, better to than I leopards. Did. Yeah, I would, I would, I would say um, also there have to be a seabird colony somewhere. So probably Iceland, uh, seabird colonies in Iceland, Latrobjörg for the puffin, something like that, which yeah. is a little bit different. That's just stunning. Um, what about jags in the Pantanal? Well, yeah, that's <laughs> there's so many. <laughs> well, jaguars in the Pantanal, that's another fantastic one. Um, I'm just sort of thinking around the world as we go. Obviously, South Georgia. I mean, yeah, yeah South yeah. Georgia is, if you haven't been to South Georgia, that is mind boggling. And the Antarctic Peninsula, you yeah. know, down there for, for 
for a whole host of things, just for sheer volume of everything, getting pictures of thousands of penguins and so on. That's got to be, how many have we got? Um, we're on about seven, yeah. I think. Um, seven. Yeah. It, it's, and if you ask me tomorrow, I'll probably come up with a whole different list. Well, I think in, in the UK as well, I mentioned Gigrin Farm. We've got some fantastic places. Gigrin Farm for red kites. You've got so many great spots in Scotland for ospreys and crested tits and pine martins. And we've got lots of lovely hides around the country. Yeah. Um, Pembrokeshire for great seabird colonies. And yes, Samantha on, uh, on chat has just mentioned Pembrokeshire for puffins. Peter. Yeah. South, South Georgia, of course, which is fantastic. What about um, Kinabatangan River? Um, yeah. Borneo, another corker of a place. <laughs> There's so many. Um, That's, uh, for, that, for that question, I, you need to ask me next time and I'll think about it. You, no, no, I can't because you'll come up. You will come up. Well, the other another one is Guadalupe Island in the Pacific for great white sharks. That's wonderful. A whole different experience again for and, underwater photography. And you know, you know the one we haven't come up. We, we neither of us have said. I was expecting you to say it, so I was I was holding off. Um, but the Great Bear Rainforest, of course. Oh, of course, for spirit bears. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and that's another one of my favourite places. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We we I well allowed two bears, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mark, I have to say this has been one of the most enjoyable evenings and one of the most enjoyable. Um, uh presentations evening presentations we've done we've done it's been absolutely yeah, fantastic fun. thanks to everyone for sending in the pictures they're brilliant aren't they great i i i don't know if you've been looking at any of the comments and the questions oh, but, I see any comments My yeah well i i banned you from seeing them so so um uh, i think um uh, bjorn has suggested we do this every quarter um so um and a number of other people have said how much they've enjoyed it which of course is lovely uh it's been absolutely super thank you so much well thanks it's been a real pleasure i've loved it yeah it's been great look um it's, it's nine o'clock and um you haven't had one sip of your beer and i've managed to finish mine Have you? you've okay. got to prove you've got one i don't believe you've really got a beer got one. <laughs> <laughs> um mark thank you so much and thanks very much everybody for being on board this evening i hope you time and we'll see you again very soon great thanks a lot chris thanks All the best. bye bye, bye.